welcome everyone who is watching. Uh, you have found yourself in the sound tech learning, geeking out and sharing strategies for recording discussion. That is a mouthful to say, <laughs> uh, but basically you found yourself among uh, some fellow uh, podcasting, mostly podcasting nerds and who like uh, actually going behind the scenes and what do we do to actually make what gets produced sound nice. Here. All right, so to get started, I thought we could all go and introduce ourselves. We're going to kind of go around how I can see people. So uh, Cole, do you want to start? Yeah, sure. Hi, my name is Cole Burkhart. My pronouns are he and him. I've been podcasting for about five years now. I'm a voice actor and audio producer. Uh, I'm not going to go through and list everything that I voice in because that will take too much time. Uh, but you can find some of the audio work that I have done um, in Home, which is a fantasy audio podcast, uh, as well as Game Closet, which is a, a TTRPG and LBGTQ uh, talk show. Um, it's very good. Highly recommend it. Uh, if you want to find everything that i've done you can go onto my website at cole burkhart co excellent john paul you want to go next sure my name is john paul garnier and i'm the producer of space cowboy books presents simultaneous times podcast which is a monthly science fiction anthology podcast excellent and james Hi, I'm James Haney, and I have been making the Starship Excelsior podcast since 2007. And uh, I'm, oh, I'm sorry. Oh, no, no, no. That's a, that's a long, I was going to comment that that's a fairly long time. <laughs> mm -hmm. To it's, say it's that's it, that's a yeah, but significant. It's just the one thing, but we've been doing it for a while. And then uh, my name is Molly. I'm your moderator for today. Uh, you'll see my name as MS Ewing. I'm a member of the Semi Sages of the Pages. It's a podcast. Um, I do all, almost all of the editing, producing on that podcast. I've only been doing it for a little over a year, though, so I'm not nearly as experienced as you guys. So I'm going to throw you guys all sorts of questions. And uh, the first one I want to talk about is for maybe people wanting to get started, you know, we're in a pandemic. Podcasting seems like a great way to maybe connect with people. If someone wants to start a podcast and they're concerned about, they want something that sounds nice. So when their listeners hear it, they, they don't think it's produced in a basement, even if it is, uh, what's your first advice if someone, you know, is thinking I, maybe I want to start a podcast, what do they need in order to have good quality? Uh, do you guys want me to point at people or pe you guys just want to jump uh, in? I can go if, if anyone else doesn't mind. Um, uh anyone can make a podcast uh if you got the time and energy for it anyone can make a podcast uh you don't have to have a fancy like uh at and uh att 2020 uh mic if you get a blue yeti or even a snowball um there's still great microphones yeah exactly um the thing that matters is your environment um if you are going to be in an echoey room uh, it's going to sound worse than if you have a room that is filled with blankets and pillows and and forts that hold in sound. Um, I can do a lot with a with a great environment and a crappy mic as opposed to a really bad environment and a really good mic. Yeah, that's right. Um, we record with people who are all over the world who are all we're all amateur, all volunteers, so we have to deal with all kinds of technology. Uh, in, we had some headset recordings early on in the show. Um, and, but what we found was, you know, you can get a good quality recording as long as the environment is good. And to my, uh, uh, less professional, more amateur actors, I usually say, uh, go find a closet where you have all your clothes hung and record in there. Uh, mm -hmm. if you don't have a closet with a lot of clothes in there, or even if you do, but you want, if it's still too noisy, grab a big comforter and stick it on your head and oh, record yeah. under there. You Blank will get real hot, <laughs> <laughs> but you will have, turn in good lines and we can deal with the low tech as, as, as Cole said. Um, but we can't, uh, if you're, if your recording is verby, we can't fix that. If your recording is full of, you know, uh, the L train rocketing along <laughs> behind your house, which I have definitely helped with. Um, we have a very hard time dealing with that, although mm -hmm. it's doable. Um, so, uh, yeah, a, a, a blue Yeti or a blue snowball is perfectly fine. It costs a hundred bucks and then just, uh, make your focus on your environment. Mm -hmm. Yeah. 
I would agree with both Cole and James on that. The environment is essential and and the equipment can be expensive if you want to go that route, but you don't need to. It's it's perfectly possible to do this on a low budget. Mm -hmm. And aside from room treatment, uh, which can be as simple as stapling blankets to your walls, I've got that all around me here. I mean, there's some more Alex, uh, which is expensive. I found that out of a trash at a studio, actually. Um, <laughs> oh, but, that's smart. Uh, I, should, I should take a look. <laughs> I found a lot of great gear that way, actually. But um, oh. attention to detail and editing, I find to be one of the most important things. And the, uh, you know, audacity, there's tons of freeware that you can use to do this. Mm -hmm. And if, if you want to zero in on your editing and spend the time, you can make it sound wonderful on no budget. When we first started Simultaneous Times, I did everything on a DR7 field recorder. Um, I, I didn't even have hardware. I mean, that was it. And it's lovely because it's portable, but uh, really don't get bogged down on the gear because there's a lot you can do with next to nothing. Mm -hmm. uh, you and mentioned that. Oh, go sorry. on. As you get more into it and you find, oh, I'm going to stay in this field for a while, it is wise to tech up. Right. Get your better microphone, get your, I, we've, get your bigger sound booth sort of thing and really insulate your, your, your closet. But if you're just starting out, yeah, by all means, just do it. Yeah. There's, should, you shouldn't, let that be a barrier to you. You mentioned Audacity, and I have to rave mm -hmm. about Audacity. Audacity is a free digital audio workstation. Uh, I highly recommend it. It's very good for beginners. It's, again, free, so you're not paying Adobe a $1,000 a month to have a, a DAW um, when Audacity is just fine. And if you missed Cole's presentation on Audacity, I will be covering some aspects of Audacity uh, tonight in the Producing Speculative Fiction podcast presentation. Uh, just a quick question. Is Audacity something we all use? I know I use it. Uh, yeah, yeah. Um, I've slowly made the shift from Audacity to Pro Tools, but I will forever stream about how good Audacity is. It is ro Sorry, robust yeah. for freeware. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I, I I do all my recording in Audacity now. When I started doing this, Audacity didn't exist yet. Um, <laughs> so um, I started out in Cool Edit Pro uh, oh. 2.0. Yeah, good times. It had a cool opening jingle every time you open it up. <laughs> cool Edit Pro 2.0. Very 90s. Um, <laughs> and then they got bought out by Audition, and I'm still using OW Audition for that. But um, but I'm not using the subscription model of Audition because that is garbage. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that is like, let's just take money from you forever. No. I I have definitely learned how to uh, pirate certain products. Definitely not pirating <laughs> Adobe, but I, I've learned how to browse the interwebs for allegedly. things that are definitely not Adobe. Allegedly. Allegedly, yeah. of course. <laughs> something uh james that you said and I'd, I'd love to go kind of circle around to it uh so some of us have been podcasting and producing audio stuff for a long time for a lot of years and i want to talk about you know how things have changed or even just in this past year um just in this past year i've got to see how things have changed like if you can record live with people versus now everyone recording virtually and trying to plug in that way so i i'd love to hear kind of this evolution uh that from your guys' standpoint on where where maybe you started, what you've seen, and, and what things are like now for you. And I am gonna gonna make James start here because I think you have the longest background. That's, sounds <laughs> right. That sounds right. Um well uh, the last year has been kind of fun, uh, because I keep having people on my crew send me little emails and things about like we I got uh, one guy, Andy Thompson, sent me like an hour-long interview with um Big Finish Audio, you know, great big audio studio. We've always looked up to them. Uh, they make all the Doctor Who audio dramas, and uh, they had like a, an hour-long featurette about how hard it was to suddenly have to record in their homes, in their closets. I'm like, hey guys, we've been guys, doing this for on. a while. <laughs> like, catch up. Yeah, come on, guys. Uh, and and it is, it's like, you know, and the whole podcast community knows how to do asynchronous recording, guys. It, it, you'll figure it out. It is, it, it, uh, you'll figure out how to act in that in that environment. Um, so the last year has not been a big change for us, except for how everyone needs a little bit more space and time and flexibility because I'm not even gonna put words on that gesture. Outside <laughs> of in this we have pandemic. Lives outside, yeah, we have lives outside of this pan of the podcast, but not really outside of our houses. <laughs> um, uh in many ways. Unless, you know, you're an essential worker or, or any number of things. Um 
way back when I started, it was very, it was a, it was a different community. Uh, uh, in 2007, well, I think, I don't know if most audio dramas were fan shows like ours were a Star Trek fan show, uh, but a lot of them were pendant productions was big in the fan space. Now that's all just gone. It's a race. They, I don't think they talk about it anymore. Uh, Darker projects was getting started with Star Wars and Star Trek uh, shows. There are a lot of fan shows on the market, and then, and it was a quiet. There were a lot of shows. I did most. I put my cast calls up in um, casting call forums because we had forums back in those days, uh, and uh, and I put a bunch of other casting calls up in Star Trek forums, and I got ninety five percent of my uh, cast responses came from Star Trek fans rather than from voice acting because there just wasn't that much of it going on. Was my impression. Uh, and, uh, uh, and then welcome to night Vale happened and that changed everything. And then people started realizing they could just do this. Mm -hmm. Uh, and I would say, I don't know, to me, there's the pre will Williams era of audio drama and there's the post will Williams era of audio. Uh, and I know that's, that puts a lot on one person, will Williams, the podcasting reviewer. Um, but when right around when will uh, arrived in the community, it just seemed like a moment where everyone there was, there was this explosion. There's all this activity now. There's these award shows. There's shows popping up all the time. Audio drama has its own category in the iTunes store. It's all very bewildering to me, and I have not been able to keep up. <laughs> I'll stop there. I think I've monopolized it for like three <laughs> minutes. So, I no, I think that's perfect. <laughs> um, uh, uh, definitely of of we've been doing. I think I've never done like an in person podcast recording. Um, I've had to go into like studio, I think like once for a thing, but everything we've done is asynchronous. Um, uh, and it's especially in terms of like podcasting in general, a lot of the earlier podcasts like Welcome to Night Vale or the Black Tapes or the Bright Sessions or anything like that were done as like a, from the medium of, oh, we are recording, it was self-aware. We are recording this on a podcast to make a podcast, but the show itself is a podcast. And now as times have changed, it's become more of a, oh, we can expand further than that. We can write stories that don't need to have this fourth wall that we're obviously or not obviously breaking. Um, and stories itself has uh, adapted and not just the production behind it. I came to podcasting uh, by way of radio um, and mm. a lot of my music department also worked in college radio. I, I got my start at a pirate radio station actually. So nice. uh, we, we kind of come from the radio aesthetic and podcast is to me an extension of radio um, mm -hmm. in a way the term podcast is almost outmoded too because none of n barely any of us are using <laughs> iPods anymore um, uh, but our our production aesthetic is very much based on uh, radio arts uh, when I was a kid I was lucky enough to inherit my sister's radio and at my bedtime there was an AM station that would play radio dramas from the 30s through the 50s so that's oh, how cool. I fell in love with with audio drama oh. and and sound effects and and uh Foley and everything. Uh, as far as your question about the pandemic changing things, it hasn't changed much for us, although a few years ago we started doing cast readings for all of the stories. And that's been a challenge uh, because we do have the actors come here, which is usually not actors, it's my friends I rope into doing parts. Um, <laughs> so lately, uh, my partner and I, who I live with, have been doing the majority of the readings. So that's the challenges that the pandemic has presented. We've had to scale down the production a little bit, uh, but I'm really looking forward to bringing the cast in because it's such a fun way to make it come to life. Uh, I'm going to say a, a quick note for us. We started right before the pandemic. And so our podcast <laughs> is a four person nonfiction like we just discussed stuff and so that was that was a hard we had started like pre-pandemic and we would get together we had a soundboard we all sat together at a table talked you know got that interaction face to face and then we did that for about i think we did four episodes that way and like four sittings and then boom pandemic ha happened and you know we are in trying to figure out like all over the place like okay does your microphone even plug into your computer how, how do you <laughs> oh, do this no. and and i'm having to coach like these the other women absolutely wonderful but you know there's stuff that people weren't used to 
Um, you know, can we record on Zoom? Can we record on Discord? Can we mm-hmm. use their third party websites for like bringing in guests for like podcasts, stuff like that? Um, we have a system now set up that actually makes it easier than when we were live. So it was a, I know that for some people for if they're in the nonfiction or they're trying to do podcasts with multiple guests, that is a, a thing that they've had to live through in this pandemic. Mm-hmm. Uh, in in the same vein for fiction, uh, having more people at home means it's been harder to to like control the way each individual like audio comes through because they're all they've all got different room noises and ambiance and all have different like microphone levels and so it's been uh, a fun challenge trying to get everyone to sound like they're all in the same room together. That is actually a question that I had on my list. Mm-hmm. Um, and that is, how do you tackle kind of voice consistency? Either, you know, one person reading a long chunk, you know, how do mm-hmm. you make them sound similar? Or if you're taking multiple people, putting them together and, and trying to make it sound consistent, do you guys have any any tips and tricks? Because that's a, it seems difficult to me. Yeah. Uh, lower your standards. <laughs> um, <laughs> Uh, like, sometimes, yeah, they're not, your, your actors aren't, it's, you're making art, and sometimes art isn't going to be perfect. Uh, so it's okay if sometimes your your voice actors don't exactly all have the same mic level. If you get it close enough, and if you tell a good story or have a good conversation, people aren't probably going to say anything, or they're probably going to enjoy the ride regardless. I find that there's a few tech things you can do to get around that as well, using tools mm-hmm. like the EQ, uh, where I'll do a bass roll off and a high end roll off to try and kill room reflections. Yes, and that that can help quite a bit. Or you know, I tend to stay away from sorry, using. Sorry, sorry to interrupt. Uh, could you explain to our listeners what that is? Sure. Uh, in any DAW that you're using, will have an equalizer in it, and typically the human uh, hearing range is between twenty and twenty thousand hertz. So you can usually pull off a little bit of the low end below 20 hertz, and most of us uh, can't really hear above 18 very well, especially those of us that are older. So, And that's where a lot of noise will sit. So you can just gently pull those down in the EQ, and it will help with issues like room noise and bass masking. Uh, so EQ is a tool for, to unify things. Uh, if you like using reverb on your voices, using the same reverb on each voice can help unify the, the spatial mm-hmm. dynamics. And then also for your readers, if they're remote, have them tack up blankets. The, the more of the room sound you can kill, the deader you can make the sound, uh, the more control you're going to have over it once you're in the mixing mm-hmm. stages. And also, um, this might not be a popular idea, but I like recording the dialogue parts in mono. And that'll avoid any Mm. um, phasing, which is sort of a complicated issue to talk about. But um, using one microphone and a mono source will help you get a unified sound where it doesn't feel like they're in different spaces quite as much. Mm -hmm. You can also Um, add in a fake background noise. I was going to mention that. A good solid background ambience really should be part of your audio soundscape anyway, I tend to think. Like you should have a, your room should have a little character to it, whatever space you're in, in, in the fiction. Um, and then you can bury a lot below that. There's mm-hmm. a lot you can put below that. If you you and if you're like, oh, there's still a little room noise, you're just like, well, I guess the background noise of the scene is six decibels louder, and now I've covered up <laughs> whatever fuzz was there. Um, I I do that a lot, very shamelessly. There's also I talked about this for like 30 minutes on a presentation on Friday, so I won't do that. Uh, but there are some really good dedicated uh, plugins uh, that are just devoted to. Eliminating room noise. Uh, most DAWs have something built in. I know Adobe Edition has a news noise reduction thing. Mm-hmm. Uh, Zotope RX7 has a noise reduction thing. Um, and it, I mean, you don't want to use those too aggressively because if you do, it will it will brutalize the actual voice that's there. You don't want to do that. Uh, but you can, if the noise floor is like minus thirty, you can bring it down to like minus seventy pretty easily, and 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 that helps manage that sort of thing really nicely and put those people in the same room. And then you can bury what's left under the background ambience. And gates can also be used for killing some of that background noise. I don't have much success Mm. with gates myself, but it is a powerful tool for that. And we have um, composers, uh, a music department for our podcast. Uh, It's amazing what a composer can do to unify space if you you have music in your podcast. Mm 
All right. I'm uh I'm learning a ton. I'm excited. I gotta remember I have to ask you questions instead of just listening in the entire time. <laughs> uh we've talked about a lot of this stuff and maybe we've already hit it, but kind of kind of going back to, you know, someone maybe is is wanting to start or they think they know about podcasts. What do you think people's like biggest misconceptions are about actually editing a a podcast and audio fiction? I don't know if anyone I, uh, wants to start here. I can start if that's all right. Yeah. Um I I think one of the biggest misconceptions is that it's going to be easy. Mm -hmm. Uh it, it's right. not. I mean, mm -hmm. we our our monthly episodes which are anywhere usually from 15 to 45 minutes with the between the whole team i'd say we put at least 100 hours of work into getting it done between mm -hmm. actors composers editing and by far the longest stage is the editing um, it's gonna so, take a lot longer than you think it will if, one hour if, per minute is what we say mm -hmm. that's that i think that's reasonable and and if if um you're gonna have a regular show like we release on the 15th of every month keep in mind that that deadline is going to be constricting have a backlog start a backlog before <laughs> you start releasing your shows please <laughs> any chance you have to work ahead do it because do i it. mean there there's been days where I am mixing the episode the day that it comes out mm -hmm. and you don't want to do that to yourself mm -hmm. because you want to pay attention stressful. to the quality Yes. It is stressful. <laughs> we try to put out a little 10 minute episode every year on December 26th, Boxing Day. And I inevitably finish the script five days before Christmas and I'm mixing Christmas night, oh, no. <laughs> desperately trying to get it out. It's like, well, no sound effects in this scene. Put it out. <laughs> yeah. There's a um, really fun, uh, like, creative project I'm a part of called uh, uh, Hubris. Uh, and we spend 24 hours writing, uh, voice acting, mixing, and producing a 10-minute podcast episode. And it takes the full 24 hours every oh, yeah. time. Yeah. I think I mean, almost every time someone starts a Star Trek podcast, this is pretty specific. Every time someone starts a Star Trek fan audio drama, they generally will come to me. <laughs> I found no. uh, oh, just no. because I've been around for so long, they're like, hey, what does James think? Um, <laughs> And they'll say, "Hey, you should promote our show." It's like, "Yeah, if you ever if you release an episode, I will promote it." Because um, <laughs> uh, ninety percent of you aren't going to release an episode, and I tell them straight up, "This is this is the reality. Ninety percent of you die. Don't be in that ninety percent." Uh, and I find that they they mm -hmm. underestimate the difficulty of editing, and often they underestimate the uh, the difficulty of writing coherent scripts. Uh, mm -hmm. And they lock themselves into like they write. 15 scripts for a whole season without having any episodes finished. And now they're mm. locked in on this path and they don't, and once they realize something doesn't work, they can't change it because they're locked in on this scripting path. That is, it's like, no, 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 no. Just, just write a script, maybe write two or three scripts. Mm -hmm. And then don't try to write a whole hour episode. Your first thing. That was one of the mistakes we made. Uh, we started with a 75 minute episode. That was stupid. Ooh, that's like finale range, baby. <laughs> It was it was a different time in audio. Uh, it wasn't as weird then. It's really really weird now though. Good lord. <laughs> um, um, and of course, this is for yeah. podcasts that are like some. I know I have a bunch of friends who have like podcasts that don't always release every two weeks. Sometimes it's once a month. Sometimes they like tell their listeners, "Hey, there's not gonna be an episode this month," and that's fine as long as you communicate with your audience. Hey, sorry, life got in the way as it always does. <laughs> And and I do want to mention, like, there are, you know, if you're into some of the nonfiction or conversational ones, there's a little less work involved sometimes. Uh, so one of my fi favorite podcasts to listen to is actually a podcast about sumo wrestling. And it's like a sports podcast, but it's all focused on sumo wrestling. Ooh. And it's like the only English version and they, that covers the sport. And they do like fantasy sumo wrestling. They, yeah, they have all this stuff. And, um... I know the I've I've talked to the people who who put it on and they elect to kind of leave some of the background noise in. Sometimes you hear a dog in the background, stuff like that, and that is their style. They're okay with that. They understand that that you know that that is a little bit more raw, and they're okay with it. Um, it's still even doing that still takes you know hours to prepare to to actually record and then to edit. Uh, but not not quite as many, I would say. 
I would add too for someone just getting started, uh, it takes a little while to build your audience. So don't be discouraged mm -hmm. if your first couple episodes don't get a lot of listens. Eventually, when you have the audience, they'll go back and check out the old ones. Um, it can take up to a year to build a solid audience. So you need to persevere. Um, oh, what and, is and they will come. What is that statistic like if you have a thousand? Podcast listeners within the first week of releasing an episode, you're in the top 10% of podcasts or something ridiculous like that. Um, it, 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 they'll come. It's going to take a bit, though. <laughs> it just I mean, takes a while and putting yourself out there and, and letting people know what you do. Mm -hmm. I think I read the stat. Um, I was looking them up earlier. It's like if you get, I think it's. It's something like 30 or 35 downloads within the first 48 hours. You're in the top 50%. Yeah, that sounds about right. So there's a, there's a lot of podcasts out there and there's a lot of them talking in the dark, so to speak. Mm -hmm. Oh, and especially now with the pandemic, uh, podcast listenership has gone down because people don't have a commute anymore. And so people don't have time to listen to podcasts. Um, hopefully with vaccines and everything else getting their shit together will have that changed eventually uh but like it it's gonna take time i think it was one of those things for a lot of us was you know during our routine we'll listen to a podcast whether that's in mm -hmm. the car working out whatever it is uh as part of your day and the pandemic really screwed up everyone's routine uh -huh. so listenership i noticed we took a big dive uh, especially in the first months and slowly worked back up. Um, and there's one last thing I'd like to add for someone just getting started, particularly if it's a, if it's a fiction podcast, not every story translates well to audio. Yes. Uh, so I, I would really recommend when, if, if, you know, if you have a slush pile, if you're taking recommendations or if you're just writing it yourself, always when you're vetting the stories, read them out loud to see how they'll feel. Because I've had some wonderful stories that I wanted to take. They were so good, but they just didn't you know, they didn't translate. And and mm -hmm. what we do when we're making audio dramas is we're doing an interpretation of the story. And I think that's really important to keep in mind. You got to read the story a lot of times and really understand what it's about so that you can deliver it with the right inflections and the right intentions. And sometimes that means um, talking to the author, asking other people to read it and get their opinions, because uh, we're not always right in our interpretations of stories. That's why I always advocate for doing like cast read throughs, find a time using doodle or whatever other thousands of organizational uh, websites we have set up a time for you and your actors to read through and see if it sounds weird or see if they have any questions or line inflections you really want them to nail. Uh, it, it a is a great way for you to meet your cast and B is a great way for your cast to understand their characters. And if there's no dialogue tag, for instance, making sure you're getting the right character doing the right dialogue is mm -hmm. extremely important. That can be an <laughs> issue sometimes if, if an author has not included that many tags. So, so with the sound aspect, we've talked a lot about the tech and the editing. Um, I'd love to talk about the human element because you guys are either recording yourselves or you're having people come in as as voice actors and recording. Uh, what kind of things do you either look for in a voice actor? Uh, we'll call them voice actors or how do you coach them? How do you get the best out of them? Uh, yeah, uh, I can talk about it a bit. Um... I've gone through a couple different forms of casting, uh, both for shows that I've written and shows that people have brought me on to produce. Um, and generally, a lot of what we look for is in the casting phase. Um, do the people that we're looking for have, um, uh, like, A, m mic quality is, is a factor. It kind of has to be, depending on which story you're writing. Um, I hate to say that it does, but, you know, it, it does. Um, uh, uh, I'll listen for any, like, because it's a, a read through or a, a casting call, it, it's all right if it's not too much, but if there's any, like, bad background audio or um, just to see if they've set up their space in a way that sounds like they would um, be able to provide that through their actual, like, when they do get the, the cast. Um, as far as, like, vocal inflections, I'm looking for people who can give me a variety. So from one take to another, do they sound like uh, different takes on a character? Do they have different change in pitch or say lines with different motivation behind it? Um, it is still 
acting, even if we're just sitting sitting at a desk behind a mic. I'll, uh, here, here's what we do, and it's I don't I have actually no idea what anyone else does anymore, except <laughs> I'm aware that casting club call exists, and I'm actually quite interested to hear how do you guys find your actors? And but first, I'll say what I do, and then I want to hear that. Um, mm -hmm. But we have a permanent open audition on our website. Anyone can just send in an audition file. We'll listen to it slowly. <laughs> but <at time. laughs> um, the first thing I listen for is just like Cole said, uh, it's uh, mic tech. Like if your microphone is super fuzzy, if there's a lot of reverb in your room, I will put you on my list and I will send you a note saying you're not, you're not there yet. But if you can upgrade the sound equipment, send us another audition. Um, for a couple of years, I wasn't allowed to be on our show uh, because I had a <laughs> terrible Samson Q1U mic and nowhere in my house to do it. So it was like, all right, well, I, I, I got to follow my own standards, right? So I'm fired. Um, then after that, we have them read a section of Shakespeare. Uh, it's we have a, a monologue from oh. King Lear and a monologue from Romeo and Juliet, and oh, no. it's hard. It forces the and it, it's challenging. It forces them first to understand what they're reading. Uh, it forces them to uh, get into the head of a character who's going through some sort of intense emotional experience, and that lets us hear. Like we could just have you read lines like. Captain, the Romulan warbird is decloaking off our port bow, but basically everyone knows how to say that. Like you just say it in a clipped military tone. It's fine. That we do that a lot in Star Trek. But what I want to hear is, are you going to be able to hit the high notes when we have a high note? And uh, Shakespeare is a great place to do that. So that really, and I don't, I don't think many people do a great job on it. Like no one goes and is like, I, this turns in a performance that I would say you should go be in the, the. Globe theater production of this, but because it's so challenging, we get to hear all of their strengths and all their weaknesses, and it exposes mm -hmm. it really nicely. I don't work with many professional actors. I, I have some friends who are professional actors, so occasionally we have someone that comes in, doesn't really need instruction, and just gets it right. Uh, oh, for the most part, it's just friends. I, I've had to learn. I wasn't a voice actor before all of this. Uh, what I usually do is you need to be gentle with the actors. Most people are nervous the first time they're getting in front of a microphone. Mm -hmm. uh, and they don't have mic technique, which takes a while to learn. It's kind of like playing an instrument. So once I've gotten the levels for the actor, I'll usually give them some kind of visual reference, like stay one hand away from the mic. So that way they're not moving all over the place, which is a tendency to do. Um, I know people like to to make gestures, which is great as long as you're not whacking into the chair, rubbing your leg, and it's picking up all of those sounds. And I've found that <laughs> a, a lot of people, when they get nervous, they'll tend to breathe irregularly, which makes for an unnatural performance. Mm -hmm. So just try to encourage breathe. them. It's, you know, you can breathe. Don't worry about the mistakes. Make as many as you need to. I will edit them out later. <laughs> Um, however, when a mistake is made, I always encourage back up to the beginning of the sentence mm -hmm. or the beginning mm -hmm. of the paragraph. Take a beat and back up. Because if you try Absolutely. and start in the middle, you might get the, the next half of that sentence great, but when you butt them up together, they're not going to work. And, yeah. and when we're speaking, we tend to be louder in the very beginning of our sentences than we are in the end. So that's something you want to um, keep in mind. A another mm -hmm. thing, uh, really you know, get them a glass of water, glass of tea, put it on a different table away from your gear, though. <laughs> <laughs> and um, we all have different aspects of our voice. You know, one of the things that tends to happen is we'll be smacky. You can hear these smacking sounds, which are very hard to remove later. Oh, that's such a pain. Here's a trick, though. Take one, have the actor take one bite of green apple. Mm -hmm. It change, changes the chemistry of your saliva, and it'll get rid of that for the most part. They might have to take another bite partway through, depending on how long the part is. <laughs> but just, just to be gentle with the actors and to be encouraging, and also to have them read slowly. When you add music mm -hmm. to dialogue, the dialogue is going to feel faster because those silences are gone. Mm -hmm. um, so I find it very important to slow down. And then... One last thing in regards to actors that I was taught by a theater director, which has been super useful to me, is um, where the actors tend to stress in the sentence, it often makes it feel weird. And if you're not sure where to add your stress in the sentence, lean towards the verb. If you stress the verb, it will feel natural. And it, it's amazing how well that works. I'm going to write that down. I'm incredibly excited about your your tip about the green apple thing uh, mm -hmm. because I was I was asked by someone to do their audiobook and I said okay well 
I've been doing this other audio stuff. I could figure out audiobooks. Oh, audiobooks are an, the, I don't know, they're, as a voice done. actor who's done them, they're, they're a bit of a different beast, um, just because of how long they are. Um, it's, it, please remember to take breaks, <laughs> uh, is all I will <laughs> say. Take breaks, stretch, move your body, because you're gonna be, you're gonna be there for, for a minute. And yawning is also helpful to keep yes. from getting too, too hoarse because once you've been um, reading for an hour, you're so dry. Mm -hmm. Remember to unlock that jaw. Um, <laughs> don't push yourself too much. Well, and and I appreciate that green apple tip because I know I did the the recording part and it was like, okay, this is fine. This is fine. Why do I make all these mouth noises? <laughs> what is going on with my mouth? We all do. And, there's a uh, there's a tool called the. I'm very sorry to interrupt. Uh, no, no, a, no, please. There's a tool called a deesser, which will help with these mm, things mm -hmm. too. And there's a lot of freeware versions. Uh, a de clicker, depending on how bad your your mouth noises are, uh, will help as well. I have spent a lot of time with single click removers, going through and finding. Oh, there's one click. Oh, there's a click. Oh, there's Blow it a up. click. Blow it up. There's a click. Blow it up. That can be a lot of that one hour per minute of mm -hmm. audio produced. <laughs> Absolutely. Yeah. And that's if you don't have to go and arrange dialogue, too. Mm-hmm. Uh, boy. <laughs> we probably don't need to jump off into the audiobook uh, world here. Um, so we have about 13 minutes left. I'm not sure if there are any questions. We can continue talking. I don't want to stop that, but I just want to be cognizant. So if there are questions from the chat, we can ask them. Uh, someone else is excited about the the fixing the smacks with an apple. So you've helped yeah. a lot Make of sure people today. Make sure it's a green one, not a red. It has to be green. Only green. And I've read some articles that suggest citrus will do this too. In my experience, yeah. that's not, it's not true. No, I wouldn't try and suck on a lemon and it didn't work. So I can verify <laughs> only apples. And, and if your throat is raw, if you've been working all day talking, um, tea. the, tea the citrus honey. is going to be bad. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So green, green mm -hmm. apples exclusively. Uh, avoid um, like milk and coffee. I know if you're like me, you drink a lot of coffee instead of water. If you're going to be doing a lot of talking, d d uh, just stick with water or, or something more neutral like that. Because coffee and milk is going to like phlegm you up uh, and you'll have to be constantly clearing your throat, which is also going to be bad for your throat. And so just, just cut it out entirely. Same with if you're a smoker, stop that. <laughs> so we're still uh, gonna keep checking if we get any questions, no questions yet, but uh, we've had a lot of great tips and tricks in here. Uh, so I figured I would come straight out and ask, have we missed anything? Have we missed any great tips and tricks if you're wanting to kind of, we really have, have wandered into audio audio production, right? How do we put this whole thing together? So if you guys have other tips and tricks, I'm sure uh, I at least would be interested. I'm sure our listeners are interested too. Uh, one thing comes to mind when, when sequencing, um, you know, especially if we've recorded all our bits of dialogue uh, separately and, and we're putting them together, um, sometimes, particularly if you have music, it can be difficult to have the, or if you have similar voices, it can be difficult, difficult to have the differentiation between them. Uh, one thing I find that really helps is you want to give a little more space than than you would in normal conversation because you need to hold the re the listener's attention and give them space to find out what was exactly said. Uh, one thing that helps with that and separating the dialogue is to use panning. Uh, I said I usually record in mono, but I don't mix in mono. And what I'll do is I will take, you know, say there's a conversation going on. I'll pan it about 10, 15, maybe 20%. That way it's coming, the conversation feels like it's from your left and right. And it really helps distinguish between voices, particularly if you have a large cast. I would be careful with that, though. Um, sometimes panning can become an issue of accessibility uh, in that people who are deaf or hard of hearing can't hear uh, the like a can't hear the panning differences or B wouldn't be able to clearly hear in one specific ear or the other. I'm actually mostly deaf in one ear. So that's why I usually do only about 10%. <laughs> so it's, you're getting it in both, but it does feel like there's a spatial difference. Yeah. Oh. So in, anything past 15%, you're, you're getting into territory that might be a challenge mm -hmm. for some people in that way. Um, 
I'm I'm also hard of hearing, um, partially in my left ear. But this is also another thing, a tip to 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 bring up is give your ears some rest sometimes. It it doesn't always seem like it, but you can get worn down and um the your ability to perceive loudness uh becomes worse the more you are exposed to sound. Um, which is why sometimes you'll start an episode and the volume's really loud. And then when you go back and listen to it uh, after you've had time to calm down, the rest of the episodes are really quiet because you have to keep turning it down because it's too loud. So take breaks, give your ears some rest. We we now have a beta listener uh, mm -hmm. who listens to every episode right after we mix mm -hmm. it down. It just says, is the loudness consistent? And if they say no, <laughs> is this then good? we fix it. Will you tell me if this is good? <laughs> Please tell me it's as good as But no, we really just tell them, can you hear everything? Mm -hmm. Like, you have to change the volume? And yeah, it, it has saved us from some problems. Yes. Uh, Another. Oh, go ahead. Sorry. Another very useful trick uh, if you're using music behind the dialogue mm -hmm. is to use your equalizer and do a gentle scoop out of the yes. amplitude of where the vocal range sits. And depending on our voice, that's generally between 80 and 350 to 400 hertz. That's where the fundamentals lie. So I'll do a gentle 1 or 2 dB scoop out of the music. It doesn't change the perceived volume of the music, but it leaves space for the mid range of our voices. Uh, same with music, you want to avoid having leads, which usually sit in that range because the speaking is the lead. Mm -hmm. We did have a question on our Discord. So someone's asking, are there any tips for stopping excessive sibilance? I think that's how you say that while recording, uh, which is, I believe, of a lot of the S noises like plosives and 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 things like that um i don't generally yeah a good pop filter yeah. um or i'll pull them out <laughs> yeah uh, mine's mine's on um yeah. but getting a, a good pop filter is going to save you like 85 percent of the trouble uh a a, a decent audio editor is going to save the rest of 15. um did a good pop filter make sure you're not sitting uh way too close to your mic um uh like has it been said before try and have a hand to to face uh distance between you and your mic um also be be conscious of how you speak um uh even just in slowing down and not being quite as forceful is going to stop those p's or your s's from uh manifesting quite as much a de-esser is also very useful for sibilance. If you don't have a de-esser or don't, how to, don't know how to use one, it's basically an equalizer that's doing a brief dip uh, above 4K. And, and that's usually where those sounds happen. So I, I actually have some templates and I recommend making templates for your EQ mm -hmm. where, oh, it's this problem. You can speed things up by just pulling up that template in EQ that'll deal with sibilance, for instance. Yeah, a lot of DAWs will let you have a preset. If you, sorry, if you don't have a pop filter or you, I, I don't know why they're not very expensive. So get a pop no. filter. You can make them out of socks. Oh, right. Sorry. That was what I was going to say. <laughs> oh, no. Stick it on top of your microphone <laughs> and it is a fine do it yourself pop filter. It helps. It doesn't help as good as a pop filter mm -hmm. and it makes your mic a little bit stinky over a long period yeah. of time. So uh, uh, please, get a pop filter. Well, please watch. I've done this. <laughs> Who, me? I mean, I, I've the, had to do it at least quality. once, about once or twice. Yeah. Yeah. Occasionally. Um, another thing, if you don't want to make a blanket fort, um, you can also use egg cartons. Um, right. Don't ask me why this is my room. This isn't for uh, uh, sound dampening. But if you line um, like a, a curved thing with egg cartons or you set it up so it kind of like curves around your mic it also helps to help dampen sound uh, so it doesn't bounce off quite as many uh, objects and for natural diffusion uh, one of the best things you can get is bookshelves with books it scatters <laughs> the high frequency sounds and won't give you as much reflectiveness so that, that's so free knowledge <laughs> I mean, it doesn't just like osmosis into you. You kind of have to <laughs> read the books. <laughs> Do you though? You can't just stare at them and look at how pretty they are. <laughs> if that was true, kids, I would have done better. In kids college. in houses with 500 books in the house have like a higher test performance. 
I believe that. I think yeah. It's cool. Yeah. I know it's almost certainly because of confounding variables, but I like to think it's just because the b- books are emanating knowledge at them. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And they have better diffusion in the room. Yeah. So there you go. <laughs> they can focus. <sighs> All right. We have about five minutes left. I don't see any other questions, uh, but I think now is a good time to maybe start wrapping up. I'd love to give you guys each a chance to remind our listeners who you are, where they can find you if they want to uh, follow what you do, want to follow you on social media, anything like that. Uh, so, Cole, do you want to kick us off? Tell, tell people where they can connect. Yeah, sure. Uh, hi, everyone. Again, my name is Cole Burkhart. You can find me on Twitter at King Nicole Miner. Uh, you can find everything I do at coleburkhart.card.co. Uh, you can find the sci-fi audio drama uh, that I am writer and creator of, uh, Null and Void. Uh, you can find that on Twitter at Null and Void Pod. And you can find the horror fantasy thriller uh, that I am writer and creator of uh, Ritual Six on Twitter at Ritual Six. John Paul, you want to go next? Sure. Uh, thanks so much for having me. Flight to Foundry has been wonderful this year. My name is Jean Paul Garnier. I am the owner of Space Cowboy Books, which is a small science fiction specialty bookstore in Joshua Tree, California. And I am the producer of Simultaneous Times Science Fiction Anthology Podcast. You can find us at spacecowboybooks.com and you can stream all the episodes right there, or you can also find us on pretty much every uh, podcast player. And, uh, and then I am oh, James Haney. So oh, it's fine. Uh, <laughs> uh, uh, Beware the Man of One podcast. Uh, you can find us at starshipexcelsior.com or you can tweet me at stexcelsior or you can email me and the rest of the team at starshipexcelsior at gmail.com and we're on Facebook. And of course, we are with all the good podcasts are sold. Excellent. So thank you guys again. Uh, once again, my name is, is Molly and well, uh, thank you for listening in to this uh, sound tech and geeking out with the four of us. Uh, have a wonderful day to all our listeners. Thank you for hosting again, Molly. Mm-hmm. Yeah, oh. thank you. Thank you, it was Molly. A lovely and time. Thank you, Cole and James. It was great talking. Great Thanks, meeting both yeah. of you. Of course.